Well, hello, Star Center Facebook audience. We are so excited today that we've got uh, one of Jackson's own, Savannah Head, uh, with us today. And I, I, I saw a, a blog post several months ago. Matter of fact, it was on May the 1st that Savannah wrote. And I, I told Cassidy, I said, we've got to reach out to Savannah. We've got to talk to her about this because it was fascinating the connections that she was making between all of us living in the middle of this pandemic and people with disabilities. And so before we jump into that though, Savannah, just give a little overview of, of kind of who you are and maybe where you went to school and stuff like that so our audience knows. All right, so uh, my name is Savannah and I went to USJ in Jackson. I graduated in 2016 and then I went on to MTSU and I graduated in uh, December of 2019 and now I'm here working in Chattanooga. So I'm slowly moving across the state and I have uh, spastic diplegic cerebral palsy. So spastic means that my muscles tighten on their own. They don't there's no communication between my brain and my legs. It lets them know when to tighten and when to loosen. And uh, diplegic meaning two limbs, mine being my legs. But uh, CP comes in all shapes and sizes. So, but that's a little bit about me and why I wrote that blog post. Yeah, well, I, I, I've got to tell you, you know, we see unbelievable things over and over and over again for folks with disabilities who are achieving things that not too many years ago, people thought weren't possible. Uh, and you are a great depiction of, uh, of what's possible. Um, was, it, was it always easy? I'm certain that it wasn't. Um, but the, the dedication and the persistence that you've shown Savannah is such an inspiration to, to all of us. And so um, one of the questions, and, and so we'll jump into the blog post, one of the questions um, that uh, that you pose is, why is everyone so freaked out? OK, and so I want to make sure that we put this in the proper context, because out of context, it could sound disconnected from this global pandemic. Um, but what did you mean when you when you pose that seemingly rhetorical question? So I just it felt normal to me. I mean, I know that a global pandemic that has killed over uh, 1 million people is not normal, but having to uh, wash your hands constantly, having to distance in public and watch your social outings, that's not something that really took me by surprise. My life didn't change all that much. You know, I do get out and about and I do um, do the best I can, but this fear that everybody else was feeling, I just didn't feel that fear. And I really, I think it comes from, you know, disability in my opinion is not characterized by a lack of ability or defined by a lack of ability. It's defined by a lack of comfort in my opinion. And so this pandemic made everyone uncomfortable, right? And, but me, I wasn't uncomfortable. I will, you know, I understood the risks and I just, you know, I just dealt with them. I just went with them and I did my best to stay healthy. And people with dis disabilities, I think we, we know what it's like to be uncomfortable, to be told this is what you need to do to stay healthy, to be your best self. We know how to, how to get, how to function in that way. And a lot of people who are uh, able-bodied, and I'll use air quotes there, sure. uh, don't know that, don't understand that. So that's, that's why I pose that question. Please. No, and, and, and I think it's, I think it's so enlightening because to your point, overnight, the world, not just people in the United States, but people around the world, all of a sudden understood what normal was for you, mm -hmm. your whole life. Because you, this wasn't this wasn't some event that triggered a disability, right? It, you, you, this has been your whole life, hadn't it, Savannah? Yes. And 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 as you, you know, your parents were teaching you, and and doctors were were weighing in on what were best practices, and you start looking at the guidance as it relates to the global pandemic, and you start going, wait a minute, this is my whole entire life, right? So it wasn't that big of a deal. 
Um, but but to, to, to draw the connection, I think, because in disability services, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to understand what it's like to have a disability, because we believe that once they understand that, they're going to be better equipped to interact with, to employ, uh, to you know, include in everything else, the more they know. And so that's why I thought this was so powerful. Uh, you hit on four things that I wanted to, to just kind of talk about briefly. Um, and, and these were the ways that you saw this alignment. And, and so the first one is, there is an anxiety over your health. That was the first thing you mentioned. Yes. Um, and, and so, so talk to me about some of that anxiety um, that that you had pre-pandemic, and how you kind of see that in others now. Yes. You know. So I have several doctors, and um, like a neurologist. You know, more than just a primary care physician, like someone who is also my age, may not even have a primary care physician, but I have to have several doctors lined up constantly. And anytime I give an illness, I have to take my disability into account. Say I get the stomach bug. Okay, well, I can't run to the bathroom. I can't, you know, different things like that. Say I get the flu. Well, I have to worry about how that affects my lungs because my lungs have developed differently. So there's a constant anxiety over my health as it relates to my everyday life. That's why I was already washing my hands consistently. You know, I, I never enjoyed people eating after me and everybody used to, or, uh, you know, or needing to eat after other people and people used to make fun of me for that. And now we're all washing our hands and, and sanitizing and, you know, and it's like, see, I, you know, I had a point here, but so this anxiety is something that is isn't in, innate within me when it comes to my health, because my health is a bigger deal, right? So um, it's a, not a bigger deal to anyone else, but it's a bigger deal because it interacts with everything in my body. Um, so, right. yeah. so so, it, it's one of those things where, you know, while, while we're doing everything we can to stop the spread of COVID-19, what you're suggesting is, you know, in your situation, getting a stomach bug you know, something as common as a stomach bug created this anxiety because it, it, it impacted so many other areas of, of life, right? Yes. Yeah. And so I, I think this is, I think this is great. So number two was the stress of not being able to go anywhere. Yeah. Um, so, so talk to me about where that alignment is as it relates to your story um, versus those of us impacted by COVID-19, the shutdown, lockdown, whatever you want to call it. Unpack that for us. So, you know, I'm as independent as I can possibly be, but I don't, I don't drive. Um, okay. So that, that's where that came in. It, you know, I, I can use Lyft and I can use Uber, but when it came to the shutdown of people not being able to get places, I just realized that that's what I've been dealing with my entire life. If I need to get somewhere immediately, I have to rely on someone else or a service. And so, you know, and I think that is, it, there's an anxiety to, oh my goodness, I have to run this errand. Will I be able to run this errand? And that's something that re reflected in everyone else. Oh my goodness, will I be able to get to the grocery store today? Will there be toilet paper? Will there be toilet paper? Yeah, that's right. So it's, that's the reflection that I made. And that, that applies to people of all disabilities because every time you go out, you get out and about, you have to adjust yourself. You have to say, okay, am I gonna slip and fall here? Am I gonna be able to open this door? So it wasn't just being able to get out and about, it's being able to get what you need from where you're going. I, I love it, I love it. We've got a couple questions here. So we're gonna take a break from our four things and, and uh, I wanna sprinkle in some questions from folks that are watching. So do you think people with disabilities are better able to cope with this pandemic emotionally than people without disabilities because the barriers, the isolation they have already had, they've already faced it and overcome it or learned how to deal with it. So would you say that that's folks with disabilities may be better equipped than those without disabilities, Savannah? Absolutely. I, you know, being, um, like I said earlier, being uncomfortable is just a part of our lives. We're used to being knocked off balance, both literally and figuratively, right? right? So it, this is just, 
this is just another day for most of us. And I don't speak for every single person, sure. but this is just another day for most of us um, because we've, we, we're used to having wrenches thrown in our everyday plans. So Absolutely. So what can an average person without a disability do to help people with disabilities? And this, this could be related to COVID-19. It might be just generally, but what has your experience been? Those relationships you've had where those folks have been helpful. What was it that they did that was helpful? Um, I always say seek first to understand. I learned that from my mom. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're, you're not sure how my body works, please ask me. If you're not sure how I can, how, how you can help me, please ask. Um, now, some people with disabilities are not comfortable with being asked questions out of the blue. So what I would say is say, first say, may I ask you questions about, uh, about your disability and then go from there. So, and I'm open and honest and that you can ask me anything about my disability because that helps you understand my world. Like say I fall in public, most people will try to rush up and they'll try to grab my arms. That's not the best way to help me up because I use my arms to get up. So the best way to help me up in that situation would be to first ask, you know, how can I help you? And usually what I need is someone to kind of guard and make sure I can stand up or maybe even put their foot next to my crutch right to make sure I can stand up don't rush for my arms that's a you know that's just an example of ask first seek first to understand how you can best help somebody with a disability because there may be something that I am perfectly capable of doing but you don't realize I am and there may be something that you think that you think I'm capable of doing that I can't do so first ask and then we'll go from, you know, and then we'll go from there. I love that. I love that. Ask first, because again, it, it, it's, it's well-meaning humans, yeah. right? That are trying to help. The problem is oftentimes we don't know the best way to help. Yeah. And so we're going to assume lots of things uh, that may or may not be true. And so instead of just assuming those things, simply ask. I think that is great, great advice. All right. So the, the third thing is um, not knowing if you'll find what you need. And so I, I think um, this has to, to do with lots of things. Um, but, but, but talk to me about that third anxiety of, of not knowing if, if you'll find what you need um, as it relates to global pandemic, I have a disability, I'm better equipped to deal with this than maybe somebody without a disability. Well, I'm used to constantly having to adapt, right? If I don't have what I need, then I have to adapt. Um, and so this, this kind of anxiety, of people not being able to find toilet paper or hand sanitizer, um, or even the right resources to to know what, what what was going on with COVID, you know, people just aren't pe people without disabilities just aren't as used to adapting, adapting and overcoming and figuring out a situation. Whereas I am constantly thrown into situations where I don't know initially how to handle them, and so, you know, people with disabilities are just more equipped to knowing how to handle situate how to handle situations um, like. We, we're used to having to stockpile certain things like hand sanitizer. You know, I was ready and prepared for all of this because I already had like a little kit of everything I might possibly need. Um, but it, anyway, it's just one of those things where, you, you know, you, you get, we get too comfortable. We forget how to adapt and people with disabilities are constantly having to say, but what if this happens? And COVID, you know, it didn't turn, you know, it didn't turn into what if this happens, it turned into this did happen. And so people were not prepared to adapt. That's exactly right. And I think, you know, I, I just, I, I look at, and, and we, we talk to employers all the time and we talk about what comes with someone who's capable of doing this work that has a disability. And one of those things, one of those intangibles that we talk about is the ability to problem solve, the ability uh, to, to be flexible and not 
It doesn't have to always be like this because we know it's not going to always be like that. But guess what? I've had to deal with that every day that I've gotten out of the bed, right? And that's what you just said, Savannah. I mean, it's, uh, and I think that is a beautiful thing. Okay, the fourth item uh, that you mentioned here is healthcare workers will be able to give you what you need. And so this is where we, we kind of transition from us interacting um, just generally into, I've got a doctor's appointment. Um, and, and I had this belief that the healthcare workers will give me what I need. And has that always been the case for you, Savannah? Um, not always, because yeah. it's uh, healthcare workers try their very best with the resources yeah. that they have, but sometimes they don't know how to fix something. Sometimes they don't have the immediate answers. And I think most able bodied people were used to healthcare workers having immediate answers, the right medication, the right treatment immediately. And I'm used to kind of healthcare workers doing the best they can, but I've had healthcare workers tell me, I just don't know how to help you right now. Right. And that's, you know, when COVID first started, that's what a lot of people were hearing as they got tested and as they came down with illnesses. And I was kind of used to that. And I know, I know many healthcare workers who, who do the best they can, who want the best for the rest of their community. And that is, you know, that's something that I've had to adapt with over time on, um, well, we don't know how to best help you right now. Um, and, and that's okay. And that's how, that's kind of how that relates because it's, you know, people just had to get used, used to hearing, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't know. Whereas I've been used to that, people with disabilities, we've been used to that our entire lives. That's exactly right. And I remember talking to a family physician right after COVID happened and, and, and locally, and so in Western Tennessee, there began to be more cases and, and more positives just in your family walk-in clinic. Uh, and and the, the pressure that the healthcare worker was under, because again, they go to med school to fix stuff and they weren't able to fix, right, this, this virus because they didn't know what medicine to give. They didn't know uh, what, what to do with anything. And, and if you remember early on, there were all this, it's like, well, do this, do this, do this, and oh, no, oh, oh, you need to do this, do this, do this. And so it was constantly changing as they were learning more. And so I think to your point about the, the diagnosis of CP, I mean, that doesn't really tell us much, right? Because there's so many different kinds of CP, right? Um, and so I appreciate you going into the, your specific, you know, diagnosis. Um, yes, it involves CP, but, but there's more to it than just that, right? Yes. Um, and so, all right, I wanted to hit on a couple other things. Um, let's see here. Um, so, it, you, you write in here, and I, and I love this, especially in this COVID-19 season, you write, we appreciate more than, than anyone, the nurses and the doctors and the janitors and the techs that work the extra hours. And so I, I think that comes from a spirit of, uh, of, of those, those folks walking with you over all these years, right? And now you see them on the front lines trying to solve a problem that, you know, there's not an easy answer for. Um, yeah. But, but you've experienced them, them working those extra hours. And so I think that's great. So we had another question that came in. Um, it said, uh, first of all, Savannah loved the fact that you went to high school, college, and then to work. So kudos on that. But oftentimes the transition from one of these to the other is delayed. And so what advice do you have for others that are going through life-changing transitions and, and how best to, to do that? Well, I, I, I did another blog post back in January called You Have No Choice But To Be Patient. And that came from a good, uh, dear friend of mine when I was frustrated back in December and I wasn't sure. I, I had, when I graduated at MTSU, I had no idea where I was going to be. Right, okay. right, no idea. Did not know what was going to happen. And she, she talked talk with me and said, you have no choice but to be patient. And I said, what do you mean? She said, most people, if they, if they are able, can start driving Lyft, can start delivering food, 
you, you know, they can immediately start earning money and they can crash on friends' couches. She said, you don't have that option. You don't have the option to sleep on somebody's couch. You don't have the option to immediately start work by, by driving people around. You have to be patient. And so my, my only advice is just, just be patient. Just do what you can in the moment. Do the next right thing for you, whether that's start earning a little bit of money or cutting cutting expenses or making connections. Do the next right thing in that moment and just be patient and know that those puzzle pieces don't always come together. I I was back in Jackson when I when I felt like Chattanooga was the right space for me, but in, you know, the first week of January, I had no idea where I would be. But by the end of January, I was up here in Chattanooga. So those pieces don't always fall fall in place immediately, um, especially not for those with disabilities. So we we know to be patient. So just do the next right thing and be patient. I love that. I love that so so much. Whether you have a disability, don't have a disability, what Savannah just gave you was gold. Do the next right thing, not the next seventeen right things, but the one next right thing. Um, and, and, and be patient. And for somebody like me, that's incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, and all right. So, uh, telehealth, I love you. You commented on telehealth. You, you, you said, gosh, we've been saying telehealth for all these years will be, be so great yeah. if we didn't have to navigate the doctor's offices and all this stuff, this would be amazing. And then all of a sudden COVID hits and yeah. They finally, they finally listened to you, Savannah. Yes. Right. <laughs> because telehealth is now, um, it's become mainstream overnight. Yes. And so you and a whole bunch of other folks that are similar to you are going to benefit, right? Yes. And from, from that. And everybody does. And I sure think they the do. Thing that, you know, people, able-bodied people, people without disabilities or impairments or chronic illnesses aren't always the best at communicating what their issue is. Um, those of us who have lived our lives in doctor's offices have, I've filled out paperwork. I was, you know, I was sitting next to my mom at two years old at Vanderbilt filling out paperwork. You know, you know I, I know the ins and outs of doctor's offices better than a lot of people. And so I think what telehealth allowed people to do is understand how to how to communicate their issue without actually being there. I think it's made people better at saying, here is my problem, here's how it's affecting my life, and he and he here's I and I don't know what to do about it. And that's I think what telehealth offered people. And that's because I think that was the initial like, oh, we shouldn't do this because people won't know how to better, how to best communicate their issues and telehealth allowed people to do that. No doubt about it. Well, Savannah, this has been a true pleasure for me to have a chance to spend a few minutes with you. Uh, and I love how you end your blog post and, and we're going to link to it. So anybody that wants to go read it can go read it. Um, but you, you talk about three things that this virus has done and you end uh, in a very positive way. And by the way, the whole article is positive, but you, you, you say that it's brought families together Number two, it's given people more time to work on what they love. And number three, it's quieted a fast-paced world. And, and I, you're spot on. Um, and I want to encourage you to keep writing, Savannah. Uh, not everybody has the ability to take thoughts and ideas and feelings and put them into words. You clearly do. And I want to encourage you to keep doing it. Um, just do the next right thing, right? Uh, what, what great, great advice. Savannah, anything else that you want to add before we, uh, before we end today's uh, conversation? Um, just enjoy the discomfort while we still have it. And don't forget, don't forget what this was like and what this brought you. Um, that's it. I love that so much. Thank you so much, Savannah. And uh, we will hopefully next time you're in Jackson, come by and see us. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Savannah.